Amen. Okay, if you're ready for the word, say, I'm ready. I'm ready too. So we've been studying the life of David, and we've, uh, we've really captured the beginning of his life. Next week takes quite the turn uh, with David and Bathsheba, so buckle up for that one. But today, I wanted to talk about this moment because last week we talked about envy. We talked about the danger of envy and jealousy. Uh, I know I've struggled with this in my life. Several others have as well. Saul is envious of David. Saul has his eyes fixed on David, and David has his eyes fixed on God. And we start to see what happens when you're focused on humans and you're focused on things instead of being focused on God. At the end of the story last week that we shared uh, from that scripture, Saul begins to throw spears at David. Raise your hand if you've ever had a spear thrown at you. So I want to meet you, okay, and hear about that experience. This is crazy to me. He has two spears thrown at him. The Bible says that David eluded him twice. And this brother took off running, like I would and you would as well. He begins to flee for his life. And right in the middle of this eight-year process of David running for, for, for uh, Saul, running for his life, we find this moment in 1 Samuel 24. If you like titles for messages, uh, the title of the message today is Don't Take It into your own hands. Tell your neighbors, say, don't take it into your own hands. Tell them. Tell the other person, say, this one's definitely for you today. All right? Seth told me, all right? First Samuel 24, it says in verse 1, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel, and he set out to look for David and his Uh, his men near the crags of the wild goats. They went on this expedition. And I just want to point out before we continue, Saul was supposed to be pursuing the Philistines, but his focus was on David and not on the mission at hand. And so he not only begins to disobey God, he leads 3,000 people in disobedience as well. And I just want to say that When you lose focus of what God has asked you to do, you not only make mistakes, but you lead other people astray as well. And he's leading 3,000 men towards David. And it says in verse 3, he came to the sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Everybody say, relieve himself. It's okay to have fun in church. We're going to have some fun today. David and his men were far back in the cave. Now, if you look up relieve himself in the original language, uh, this is what it says. It, it says dropping off the Browns at the Super Bowl, all right? And uh, if you're still not smiling this morning, you should really, really lighten up, okay? Remind your face, the joy of the Lord is here. So uh, King Saul, I love that this is the scripture we're reading with the kids in the room this morning. It's just great. Uh, King Saul is recorded in scripture turning a cave into a porta potty this is, y'all, this is the Bible. Don't get mad at me, okay? I'm just reading the Word of God. This is a crazy moment. As I was reading this, I'm like, why in the world, during the process of figuring out what's going to be in the Bible, did they say, oh, yeah, let's leave this part in there? This is, this is crazy to me. So he goes into a cave, and it just so happens to be the exact cave that David and his men are hiding in. So Saul's in a cave using the restroom in front of 600 other men. And he thought he was in private. He tells the 3,000 men, y'all stay outside. I need to go to the restroom. And he had a pretty large audience. And I just want to paint the picture for you. Have you ever been in a porta potty Just raise your hand. Okay, y'all know this is a vulnerable place to be. Because of the aroma, inside and outside of the porta potty And then you go in and you're like, I don't want to touch anything in here. There's evidence of potential crimes that have happened here. And, and it's like, this is, a, this is a vulnerable place to be. This is the best example I could give you. And you go in, and it's like you're a hovercraft. You just, you're not touching it. You're like, this is, I just want to get in and out. There's a line. It's 97 degrees, and you're at a Razorback tailgate, all right? It is a bad place to be, y'all. Everybody in the room say, woo pig shooey, all right? It's, <laughs> all right. Hopefully you're awake by now. We have a rule in the Tomboli uh, family for my son, Zane, He's a PK. He's a pastor's kid. He's trained to every place that he goes into to be nice and to greet people. That's just, that's what we do as a family. That doesn't work well when you go into public restrooms. Um, 
it gets a little weird and uncomfortable. So my son, you know, he, he act, he'll, he'll, ask like, he'll act like a door greeter everywhere he goes to church. But hi, how are you doing? Hello. Hello there, kind sir. He doesn't say that, but he's, you know, he's like saying stuff to them. Well, he walks into these bathrooms, and now we have a rule. When you go in bathrooms, you can't touch anything, and you can't speak. Don't say a word. As soon as you open that door, nothing can come out of your mouth because we walked in a restroom one day, and I don't know where we were, but, um, and he'll go in there. He'll greet people at a urinal. Hi, how are you doing? And people are like, get your kid. Like, I'm sorry, man. He loves people. I don't know what to tell you. The one guy was walking out of uh, one of the stalls, and Zane looked at him because we ask Zane this all the time. And Zane said, did you go number one or number two? <laughs> and the guy just looked at my son. He didn't say anything. I said, you heard the man. Answer him, you know? <laughs> okay, listen, I, I guarantee you that Saul, King Saul, in this moment going into this cave, did not know that for the rest of history, his little bathroom break would be recorded in the most historically accurate book to ever exist. He had no idea that Christians would read about this moment today and that we would try to learn something from what happens in the text. Hear me. If God noted this little bathroom break, if he knows the little details of King Saul's life and how many hairs are on your head, how much sand is on the seashore, let me tell you, everybody look at me. He can handle the little intricacies of your life as well. And he wants to speak to you and encourage you today. It says in verse four, the men said, this is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I, I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. At this moment, David's men were saying, this must be from God. This must be an ordained moment set up by God so that you could kill King Saul. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever been given bad advice? But have you ever been given bad advice and the person giving that advice to you tried to make it sound like it was from the Lord? Like God told me to tell you. He didn't tell you that. <laughs> Some people tell me, God told me to tell you this, Seth. And I'm like, I don't know what God you're talking to, but that wasn't the one I serve. You know, like this is a moment. These guys are trying to lead David to do something that is not wise to do. He's not supposed to touch King Saul. I want to tell you just because a bunch of people are saying the same thing and they're saying it loudly doesn't mean that you're supposed to listen to it. A crowd is not typically the voice that you need to listen to. Write this down this morning. Always seek godly counsel. This is, man, this could set someone free this morning. Always seek godly, godly is very important, counsel. Because there's a big difference between advice and, and godly counsel. We told our men's group uh, this Wednesday morning, this past week, we do not seek counsel from those that do not seek God. Do not seek counsel from those that do not seek God. If they are not seeking the Lord, then you shouldn't be seeking after what they have to say about whatever it is that you are trying to figure out. I want to tell you, be careful taking counsel from people who do not submit to the authority of Scripture. Because they're giving you advice filtered through their own personal experience, not through the power of the Word of God. I've learned in life that the loudest voice in the room may not be the one that I'm supposed to follow. It's typically, I don't know if you've had this moment, it's typically the whisper. It's this little nudge from the Lord. It's a, it's a, it's a soft voice, meaning that you have to get still and quiet to listen closely. Many people go the wrong direction in life and listen to awful advice because they're taking directions and taking counsel and advice from people who have no relationship with the Lord. I just want to encourage you as we pause real quick to take advice from people that are submitted to God. Thankfully, David did not listen to these men. He knew what God had spoken to him, and he was obedient to God. Everybody say obedience. Did you know that there's never going to be a, a pile up on the street called Obedience Street, but there will always be a 20-car pile up on Easy Street? Everybody wants what's easy. Obedience Street is rarely congested, but Easy Street, you can't find a parking spot. Because we want what's easy, and typically in my life, I can't speak for you, what's easy typically is, is the opposite of what means to be obedient. When God wants me to be obedient, it's going to require 
some change in my life. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you want what's easy or do you want to be obedient? There's a difference. Do you want what's easy or do you want to be obedient? I want to give you the contrast between Saul and and David. Saul did what was easy. David did what was obedient. Saul lived to please his flesh. David lived to please God. Saul wanted what he wanted. David wanted what God wanted. So Saul is in a vulnerable position. He's in the middle of a cave. He's got 600 men watching what he's doing, which is just weird that this is in the Bible. And instead of David coming up and taking Saul's life, look what he did. It says, verse 4, then David crept up unnoticed And he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. We're going to come back to this at the end. And afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. All of this happened and Saul did not even know that it happened. He did not know that his robe was touched. Uh, What does this mean? Uh, when, When he says conscience stricken, it means that you feel badly about something that you've done. David felt guilty. He felt conviction. I want to ask you this morning, have you ever been in a place where you didn't commit the sin that you set out to commit, but you kind of made a small compromise? Maybe you didn't do the big thing, but you, you did like a little, you just, you just kind of glanced. Maybe you didn't fully follow through with the thing that you set out to do, but you had a small moment of compromise. This is what we see with David. And, and I'll tell you this. He tiptoed a little bit into disobedience. And if you have kids, you know they do this stuff all the time. They didn't do the big thing, but they kind of did a little thing. If, you, if your kid's just with you, just nudge them a little bit. Say, this, you need to listen to Seth this morning. Y'all, I, if you've got kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've been around kids, you know this. I've got a two- and four-year-old, Zane and Haven. They have become partners in crime. They spur one, ch- one another on, not towards Christ. I'm thinking it's the opposite direction. You need to pray for my kids, all right? So they, I, they, are, they accomplice each other in their little crimes they commit in the house. I got home the other day, and I put my bag down, and I, I, was, I was tired, and, and I was already a little frustrated about some things. I walk in, and my, my kids are just peacefully with their markers. You see how this is going to go, coloring their, uh, their little coloring books. I mean, it was the sweetest thing ever. They're like sitting close to each other, eating their little snacks. They got this little table. It's a little miniature table, and they're coloring. Zane's learned to color in the lines. I'm so proud of him. And and it's just a sweet moment. And then I look over to the right, and and there was a there was a white wall. It's not it's not white anymore (laughs) because my kids learned how to graffiti overnight or something. And and so I'm looking at this wall and I'm trying to figure out who did this. So there's scribbles all over it, and then right next to the scribbles, there's these perfectly drawn crosses. And there's like 20 of these crosses. And I'm like, one of my kids has has forsaken me. And so I turn, the first thing I can think of is where is my wife at? Like, I'm like, where is Kendra? She was doing something. And I'm like, Kendra! You know, because I'm about to put the kids in a kennel. We don't even have one. I was about to get on Marketplace, get a dog kennel, put the kids in the kennel. And, and, and I'm kidding. But I, I'm hollering at Kendra. I'm like, babe, what is it? So I look at Zane. And right when I look at Zane, this is what he says. Sissy did it. <laughs> and I'm like, hold up. My daughter does not know how to draw crosses. She's two years old. So I look at Zane. I said, sissy does not know how to draw crosses. And he said, I taught her how to do it earlier. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm like, what is true and what's not true? And, so, and then I'm mad. I, I, get, I get frustrated. And I said, Zane, you've got one chance to tell me the truth. If you don't tell me the truth, if you blow this right here, there is going to be a big consequence. And my son says, well, what's the consequence? <laughs> and I'm like... I have an FBI, like, negotiator, like, being raised in my home. Y'all need to pray for, for us. And, and, and then he's like, we tell him, I tell him the consequence. I'm going I'm to whoop your butt. I'm, don't spare the rod. You're, you're in trouble. And, and you're going to be separated from God. Okay, I didn't say that. But well, he said, Daddy, I drew the crosses. Listen, as soon as I looked at my son, he knew something was wrong. And I want to ask you this. Have you ever been in a moment where you just, you knew that you blew it. Where, where the, you had this conscience that, it was like this conviction. There was this moment where like, I need to come clean. I don't really know what I need to say. 
And then maybe you're confronted about it and you kind of tell the truth. I taught Sissy how to draw the crosses. But then it's like, have you ever been in a moment where you just need to really come clean and bring it? Listen, David was so sensitive to the Lord. I love this about David. David felt conviction and he acted immediately. Everybody say immediately. There's power in that because he messed up and then he owned it. Look, I, this quote, it, it wrecked me this week. Conscience is a dear friend to hurry you into the arms of the only Savior. And in those arms, you can be forgiven, you can be released, and you can be set free. Uh, this is what I, I realized. Conscience was a dear friend of David's, <laughs> but self-confidence was a, was a dear friend of Saul's. David had sensitive conscience and conviction from the Lord, and Saul had a self-centered confidence. One of those brings you to your knees, and one of them brings you to sin. One of them brings you to a place where you're on your face before God, and the other one brings you to a place where your chest is puffed out and you think that your way is the best way. Saul, a man who had an abundance of pride, did not even know that moments before he was in a vulnerable position. And I've realized this. Anyone who really wrestles with pride, anyone who is confident in their own strength, you will find yourself in moments of vulnerability and you won't even know it. Inches away from death, and you won't even know it. It says in verse 6, David said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. He's repenting to his guys. The Lord's anointed, or, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Talking about Saul. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men, and he did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave, and he and he went on his way. So, so Saul has no idea. He walks out of the cave. David just publicly repented in front of his guys. Hey, what I did was wrong. I shouldn't have done this. And he tells them, whatever you do, do not kill Saul. I, I wrote down, David could have slaughtered Saul. But instead, he cut off a small piece of his robe. It was just a small compromise. It was just a little moment of disobedience, and, and David was quick to repent about it. If I was David, I would have been like, well, well, I didn't really touch Saul. I didn't touch the Lord's anointed. I just cut off a piece of his robe. Have you all ever done this where we kind of justify our sin a little bit? Well, I didn't really do the big thing, but he was so quick to repent. Would you write this down? Be quick to repent. Be quick to repent. Be quick to own up. Conviction led David to confession, not only just to the Lord, but he confessed to the men that he was leading. I've learned this about a good leader. They don't keep their mess-ups private. They'll tell the people they're leading that they blew it. Have you all ever noticed this with great leaders? One of my favorite things I've learned from godly men that I follow is they own it when they mess up in front of the team that they lead. Be quick to repent. I, I believe this is a word for somebody Today, David shows us that even when we make a small compromise, that we should move swiftly towards repentance. Maybe you've been moving slowly towards Jesus. Today, I want to encourage you, move swiftly towards repentance because God has been moving swiftly towards you. In the middle of our sin, the word says that God still moves towards us, pursuing us. I love this idea. David was a man after God's own heart, not because he was sinless and perfect. It's because in the middle of his disobedience, he was so quick to own it. He was so quick to come clean, so quick to repent. It says in verse 8, Then David went out of the cave and he called out to Saul, my Lord, the king, and when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and he prostrated himself with his face to the ground. I want to remind you, Saul was trying to kill David. Are y'all with me this morning? He is bowing down to the very man that had just thrown spears at him, that had just caused him to leave his sheep, leave his family, leave his job, and he was running for his life, and he still chose to honor him. He still chose to submit because God spoke to David. I write this down. Instead of getting even, David got low. Instead of getting even, David got low. No apple bottom jeans or boots with the fur, according to the word. He just got low. He, he got low, but listen to me. 
it's really easy just to kind of breeze past this moment. It takes a lot of humility to apologize to a king that is trying to kill you. It takes a lot of humility to go to a guy who is impatient, impulsive, proud, disobedient, arrogant, dishonest, manipulative, the list goes on, rebellious, cowardly, delusional, fearful, jealous, murderous, vengeful, faithless, and angry. Some of you are like, you just described my coworker. <laughs> Listen, to, to get on your face before an evil king and say, I'm sorry for this little bitty compromise, that takes some humility. Why do you think David was a man after God's own heart? It's because of stuff like this. And we can learn from this in front of 3,600 other men, David models what it looks like to trust God in full humility. Instead of cutting down Saul, David cut down his own ego. Instead of killing Saul, David killed his own pride. And I just want to dream a little, about, a little bit with you. What would it look like for us to be a part of a church where everybody killed their own ego and their pride? And he said, I just want to humbly serve God. I don't have an agenda. I don't have my own little to-do list. God, whatever you want is what I want. Your way is, is my way. I don't want anything other than obedience. I dream about that. David takes the most untraveled road in humanity, and this is what it's called, humility. Humility. This isn't popular preaching in 2023, by the way. <laughs> Be humble, submit to the enemy in this moment where you can honor because God has spoken to me not to harm the king. And we see something crazy that happens. Instead of getting even, David got in the lowest position possible. Does this sound familiar, by the way? Because a lot of people will read the Old Testament, and they're like, I don't see Jesus anywhere. Yes, Jesus was born in the New Testament, but there's glimpses of him everywhere throughout the Old Testament. If you look close enough, hear me. Being chased down by the enemy, he's done nothing wrong. He prostrated himself on the ground, submitted himself even to the enemy, took the high road by getting low. This sounds just like my Savior. Sounds just like Jesus to me. Jesus, instead of getting vengeful, hateful, and angry, he humbled himself. He took on human flesh, died the death that we deserve, assumed the position of a servant, and he got low by getting hoisted high upon a cross to take our sin. Instead of getting even, Jesus evened the playing field. And by doing that, he gave us access to the Father in heaven through his own blood in his own body. And today, I just want to suggest to the church, and myself as well, what would it look like if we decided to get low in humility instead of getting even? Even when you are justified in being angry. Even when you're right. Even when you have every reason to be upset and frustrated and mad and vicious. The Bible says God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. For, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves, what? They will be exalted. I love the word, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. David got this right. It says in verse 9, as we get ready to close, he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you. He's, he's on his face before King Saul, and he's trying to help him understand, dude, I'm not trying to kill you. He says, this day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in, this, in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not lay a hand on my Lord because he's the Lord's anointed. Verse 11, see my father, he's calling him Lord, my father, he's honoring him. Look at this piece of robe in my hand. This is a VBS shirt, but just go with me, okay? He says, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there's nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. And this is what he says, may the Lord judge between you and me. David says, instead of me taking this matter into my own hands, I'm going to put it in the hands of God. What would it look like if we lived in a world where everybody had that approach. Instead of taking matters into my own hands, 
I'm going to put matters into the hands of God. We would see revival. We would see complete change. David is holding a piece of the robe in his hands. And I want to tell you this morning, what he is holding in his hands is evidence of God's grace and God's mercy. This is evidence of God's grace and God's mercy because the piece of cloth represents this is what could have happened to you, but it didn't. This is what could have happened in your life, but it, but it didn't. Did you know grace is receiving what we should not have received? And mercy is not receiving what we should have received. He's telling King Saul, I could have killed you, but I didn't. I didn't take matters into my own hands. This is a picture of grace and mercy. Would you just humor me real quick? Would you put your fingers on your neck right here? Everybody, I'm looking at you. Don't be too proud. You won't be act active in church, all right? Y'all feel that? Hopefully you feel something. It's a pulse. Y'all feel that? All right, everybody put your hand over your heart. You should feel a heartbeat. All right, everybody do a little couple of breaths in your hand. That's called bad breath, all right? <laughs> if you would do, just please humor me. Would you wrap your arms around yourself? This is not a self-love talk. Everybody just right there. Some of y'all needed a hug this morning, all right? What you are holding on to this morning is evidence of God's grace and God's mercy. Do you want to know why? Because there's breath in your lungs. There's blood flowing through your body. There's a pulse. You've got a heartbeat, and God's not done with you. He's got a reason for you to be alive right here, right now. And it's not a coincidence that you're at New Life Church this Sunday at the late service because you slept in. I slept in this morning. I'm just repenting before the Lord, all right? Please hear me. Everybody look at me. If you are here and you are alive, which both of those things are true, if you're watching online, God is not done with you. Hear me. Do not take your life into your own hands. Do not take matters into your own hands. It is way more beneficial to give your life to the king of kings. He kind of created you. He's pretty good at being God, by the way. This is evidence of grace and evidence of God's mercy. This is a gentle reminder today to stop being so casual about what God has called you to do. What would it look like if a couple hundred people in Northwest Arkansas humbled themselves before the King of Kings and said, God, you can have your way. Whatever you want to do is what I want to do. Your yes is my yes. Your no is my no. Whatever I, I'm telling you, we would see a city transformed. We would see a region that's known for something different than Wu Pig Sui. I love the hogs, but I believe that the presence of God is going to fall on this region and people will look at Northwest Arkansas and say, God is moving there. I'm going to move there as well. That's what I desire as a pastor. It's not a cute church service. I'm done playing church. I want to see a move of God in a city. I want to see revival break out. You want to know what happens first? It's humility and repentance. Humble yourself before God under the mighty hand of God and God will lift you up. What would it look like if we were quick to repent? Even in the little moments of disobedience, I love the Bible because that moment in 1 Samuel, 24 wasn't the first moment that Samuel and, or Saul had this moment with a robe. If you rewind back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, you would see right after Saul, King Saul is anointed as king. Samuel looks at him and gives him an assignment. He says, I need you to go and attack the Amalekites. And when you do this, do not take any of the possessions for yourself. And it's beautiful what happens. It's called disobedience because we're humans and we're all broken. King Saul literally just got anointed. He just got the job. And what do y'all think he did? He went and blew it. The people wanted a king, so they chose a king. They wanted a king other than the king of kings, and they got exactly what they asked for. They got a lousy leader. And so he goes out, they kill the Amalekites, they keep a few people alive, and he takes some prized goats and some prized sheep and some prized cattle, and he keeps them for himself because that's what the flesh does. And he goes in Samuel. This is crazy. I was reading this last night. It blew me away. Saul takes matters into his own hands. 
and Samuel comes up to meet him, and, and he meets Saul. Don't miss this. Where he met Saul was at a place where he built a monument for himself so that everybody would worship him. That's kind of messed up, I'm just saying. And Samuel looks at him and he says, what have you done? And Saul begins to lie about everything that he's done. He has no conviction, no conscience, nothing like David. And Samuel confronts him, he rebukes him. In verse 22 in chapter 15, this is many years before this moment that we had just read about. It said, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to God's voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. This is where that text comes from. And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. And he goes on, he says, stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Stay with me. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command in your instructions. I was afraid of the men. And so I gave in to them. Hear me. As soon as you start becoming more fear fearful of men and women than you are of God, you will always make the wrong choice. You will always crumble under pressure, but as soon as you do not submit to the fear of man and you say, I fear one man and it is God Almighty, you will always be in favor with him. He listens to the men. He does the wrong thing. It says, now I beg you, forgive my sins and come back with me. He wants the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. This is when it gets good. Get your popcorn ready. Verse 27, as Samuel turned to leave, after he rebukes the king, Saul caught a hold of the hem of his robe, and he tore it. And Samuel turns around, and he said to him that the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one who is better than you. This was a prophetic picture of what would happen years later when David, his neighbor, would come and become the king, one who was better than him, not because he was perfect, but because he was submitted to God. So if you fast forward all the way back to 1 Samuel 24, David is holding a piece of the robe, and you want to know what this is a picture of? It's a picture of grace and mercy. Saul, you should be dead, but God spared your life. And li listen, please don't miss this. This little piece of robe was a reminder to Saul. As soon as he saw that piece of robe, I bet you he had a flashback to 1 Samuel 15 when he was disobedient to the Lord and he tried to snatch something for himself that only God could give by his hand. And he, lo he lost his position he lost the anointing, and it was a reminder to Saul of what God had spoken to him. This should have been a turning point for Saul, but instead of turning to God, he turned from him. He, he repents kind of casually. David, he, he says that, I know that you're going to become the king. It's going to be established into your hands. This story teaches us so many things. I could talk about it the rest of the day, but y'all got to go to Golden Corral. Hear me. Please hear me. God's way is better than yours. God's way is always better than your way. And we learn that Saul takes matters into his own hands and everything is torn away from him. David places everything into the hands of God. And, and this is what happens. God places the kingdom into his hands. If you would just close your eyes across the room. If you would open your hands out in front of you, just as a posture of like, God, I don't want to take control. I want to give everything to you. When we understand that our life is a picture of God's grace and God's mercy, that if you have breath in your lungs, that God is not done with you. If your heart is beating in your chest, God is not done with you. What God spoke to you 20 years ago, what he called you to, the gifts that he gave, he's not done with you. Would you receive that this morning? And right there with no one looking around, would you just ask this question, do I relate more with King Saul or King David? Have I been humbly submitting myself to the Lord of Lords or have I been submitting myself to my own agenda in my own plan? I wanna encourage you this morning, when it comes to your life, 
Would we be people that refuse to take it into our own hands? So God, right now across the room, we honor you and we ask God that you would continue to move through this church, that we would be people who are humble enough to say, hey, we got it wrong immediately, that there would be no pauses before repentance, that you would draw us to yourself. God, today we say sorry for the times that we've got off track, the times that we've made things more about us than you, the times that we have forgot to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and that we got off track. God, we repent right now across the room. If you need to just say, God, I'm sorry for letting you down, for, for going my own way right now, under your, under your voice, would you just say, God, I'm sorry. God, right now I repent and I'm turning back to you. I don't want to build my own little kingdom. God, we fix our eyes on you today. We want to be more like King David than King Saul. Da David was not a man after your own heart, Lord, because he was perfect. He was a man after your heart because he was humble and he was always quick to repent. God, let us be people who are quick to repent. God, this whole thing, it, it puts a focus on you, Jesus. So across the room right now, if you're in this place, maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus or you feel like you are so far from God. Right there in your seat, you can have a moment to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Hey, please hear it from me first. We make really, really bad kings. <laughs> We make really, really bad lords, especially of our own life. Would you invite him in and just say, God, would you have your way in my heart? Today I put faith in Jesus, the King of kings. I, I say today, God, that I put faith in the resurrection, that you did not stay in the grave. You died on that cross and you rose again. God, you did it for me. You did it for my sin. Today, God, I want to make you the Lord of my life. If you're doing that right now across the room, all of heaven is rejoicing. They are cheering. They are celebrating because one of God's kids has come back home. So right now across the room, I just want to stay in this moment. Would you let God speak to you? Maybe it was a little compromise. Maybe it was a big moment where you had a moral failure and you feel like God is done with you. He is not done with you. His grace is for you this morning. He bled. He died for you. That thing that you're holding on to right now and you think it's completely not possible to be forgiven. God forgives you. You just got to put it in his hands. And so today, God, we say we don't want to take it into our own hands. We ask that you would move in this place. God, I pray that across the Northwest region that people would run to the foot of the cross, that they would forget about their own achievements and accolades, God, that this would be a place that people can come in regardless of what they've seen, regardless of what they've said, and regardless of what they've done. Let this be a house of the Lord, a house of worship, a house of prayer, God. I pray that we would be people of repentance that are so quick to say we blew it and to be so quick to put it in the hands of God. So right now across the room, I pray that joy would hit your spirit in the name of Jesus. You have a reason to give God praise and he is worthy of it all. God, thank you for what you're doing in this church. Today, as we repent publicly and fix our eyes on you during this worship song, God, I just pray that we lift your name high. It's all about you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.